So I thought I'd make a video about this power supply. This is a Qualadyne uh, power supply. I, I actually designed this into a product called Maxbox when I was at Datacube in the late 80s. And this is a late 80s vintage power supply. It's 850 watts. It puts out 120 amps of plus 5 as well as uh, plus 12, minus 12 and um, 24 volts. So when I first bought the Maxbox system I powered it up and the LEDs on the CPU uh, went on and I thought okay at least it's at least it's got power. So I messed with it a while and I was trying to get the Spark uh, CPU working and so I was looking at the serial output from the CPU to see if it was outputting any, any uh, console messages and I was getting garbage on the on the serial port and I thought what's going that's weird why why would it do that finally uh, turns out measuring the 5 volts on a VME system is not it's not trivial you can either dig into the into the um, into the card cage from the front and find the 5 volt and ground uh, signals or you can they're you know they're big beefy bus bar connections uh, or you can uh, access it from the back pretty easily anyway I finally stuck a panel a digital multimeter on there and sure enough the 5 volts was 4.2 volts and it was driving you know a few amps of, of load nothing crazy um, so anyway that's when I realized that uh, now the power supply is uh, is not working so I took the power supply out to debug it on the bench and I noticed there were some loose components inside it. It's like, that's always a bad sign. So I opened it up, and sure enough, some, I forget whether it was some diodes or capacitors, some, something came loose inside the, uh, inside the enclosure. So I thought, oh, this is not good. Um, so I spent a couple hours trying to debug, troubleshoot the power supply, and uh, with no luck. In fact, I think I, if anything, I probably made it worse. So I pulled the power supply out and I quick jury rigged a PC power supply into the VME chassis and uh, sure enough the Spark CPU came up and life was good. So I put this aside and I was, I was going to scrap it. It's you know 10 pounds of e-waste, lots of, lots of lead from the, um, from the late 80s and um, I was just about to send it to the scrap bin when I realized now nah, you know there's a lot of parts in here there's heat sinks there's uh, high power semiconductors and, and in addition uh, you know this is an 850 watt power supply it has it has four outputs and each output is not only isolated but they're individually regulated and so I was sort of intrigued um, you probably know that since PC power supplies and just about every um, low-cost switcher that's out there now, they regulate a single the main output. Usually, it's the five volts or 3.3 or whatever, um, and the other outputs are unregulated. They're, you know, they they will have some variation with load, and um, and they'll even have some variation with, for example, the 12 volt output on a PC power supply will vary if you vary the uh, load on the 5 volts as well. So anyway, um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a fine way to make power supplies, but this is certainly a, a more, uh, a better and more elaborate way to do it. And as a result, this power supply costs, I don't know, $1,000, I think, when we were back in the 80s when we were buying these in the early 90s. Um, so anyway, um, I thought maybe I could learn something about opening this thing up and taking it apart it's of course there's no schematic for it so uh, we'll we'll see what happens it'll be an adventure if nothing else I'll scrap the individual components of it and and uh, and save save some uh, you know um, part out some of the components for future projects If nothing else, I'll get some uh, high power components out of it and uh, and then I'll uh, scrap the uh, 
scrap the case as uh, as metal um, as metal scrap and and scrap some of the components as well and then scrap scrap the uh, circuit boards as so we've got the unit open and it doesn't come apart very easily but I'll give you a quick tour of what we're faced with here obviously the fan the bottom barrier strip is the ACN and the 120 240 jumper uh, this connector here sorry this is the uh, the three outputs from the uh, from the auxiliary supplies the 212 volts and the 24 volts the connector on the left is the remote sense for the three auxiliary channels and this this connector little six pin guy that I have a cable on two of the pins are the remote sense terminals for the five volts and these two pins are the uh, enable and so I just I just stick a, a jumper clip on there to turn the power supply on and obviously those are the monster uh, 120 amp output lugs I'll give a quick tour before I actually uh, power it up and show you what's wrong so this is the auxiliary board and we won't talk about that so much uh, this is the main power transformer here you can see all those windings going up to the auxiliary board as I said each auxiliary output is isolated so each one of those is an isolated uh, winding so I've got the auxiliary board propped up with a screwdriver temporarily so the AC comes in and that big inductor you see under the big caps is the AC in uh, common mode inductor. Then up here, there's the main bridge rectifier. And this, I think, is a, it's a notice it has three pins. It's either a triac or an SCR that uh, is either a pre regulator, I am not sure, or, uh, or an or a switch for the main AC because the input pretty much goes directly in. I haven't quite found the the fuse yet but I know it's in there somewhere or those uh, aqua caps or the uh, uh, filter the probably the uh, X and Y uh, filter capacitors. Then after the rectifier there are six of these uh, beefy 1500 microfarad 200 volt uh, main storage capacitors and they're configured to uh, basically be plus or minus 160 volts so it's about 320 volts total those two big blue capacitors are the output um, those are the main 5 volt output capacitors and those uh, that big heat sink has uh, four big diodes on it and those are the output uh, the main output diodes for the uh, bridge rectifier for the 5 volt output good size heatsink and there are, four, there are four big transistors on that heatsink and those are 400 volt 15 amp transistors and that's a big H bridge there in the middle between there all, all there is is some uh, wiring and a circuit board This is the main 5 volt board, so the AC in comes in here, and if you look down you'll see uh, the big common mode inductor there, and this is the AC uh, path. It goes out to the uh, some wires that wire to the full way rectifier, and then the three big filter caps on the plus 160 and on the minus 160 are here, so that's 300 volts worth of filter caps. Those caps come in uh, on these two thick traces here and they go directly to the H bridge. So this is the wiring to the H bridge. You can see that's all isolated from the main ground. And I haven't, I haven't quite figured out the H bridge yet. I, I did figure out what transistors it's using and there are four of them. And they're mounted to that big uh, heat sink that's in the center. And then the rest of this is all the 5 volt control logic. So I measured uh, the 
VBE of the four H bridge transistors and they were they were pretty close to shortage ground they were under an ohm of resistance on each and instead of thinking that they were shorted I thought maybe those are transformer coupled into the base emitter uh, this is not a FET design you know the big H bridge is using a beefy NPN power transistors high voltage power transistors and I think because of that um, you need a lot of base current to drive and turn on those turn on that H bridge so they probably use a separate transformer to drive the H bridge uh, base emitter and that would explain why you, you get as low resistance between the base and emitter of the uh, H bridge of the four power transistors so the unit is plugged in now and it's enabled pin is not connected but there is 320 volts across the uh, big capacitor bank 323 something volts uh, and th that apparently is on all the time um, so it looks like when you enable the power supply and it draws about uh, draws about 10 watts of power when it's just plugged in but not enabled the only thing that's of interest is the fan sort of ticks once when you first turn it on. Let's see if I can demonstrate that. If you watch the fan closely, you'll see just barely starting to turn there. See? Right when you first turn it on, the fan starts to turn a little tiny bit. And that's it. That's all the fan does. It doesn't rotate any more than that. And uh, and it doesn't start up and the fan doesn't start up so something between the high voltage DC section and the 5 volt output is not working I, I started a schematic for the power supply just to sort of document what I see here and to try to understand what's going on so um, AC line and neutral come in go through a fuse and an AC filter uh, there's a funny circuit with a triac. It looks like a triac. It's a big three terminal device. Uh, high power. And I think that's a soft start uh, because the, uh, the diode bridge is a, and the uh, capacitors are pretty beefy here. And that would probably blow a breaker or a fuse if it weren't for the uh, soft start circuit. Uh, the capacitors are pretty massive. 15,000 microfarad. 15, sorry, 100 microfarad, 200 volts, and there are six of those. And that generates plus 320 and a return, plus 320 return. That goes to a big H bridge made out of transistors, and those transistors are uh, RJH6678s, and they're 400 volt, 15 amp transistors. And then that H bridge drives a transformer, transformer drives another heavy-duty uh, diode bridge and then the two output capacitors and that generates the plus 5 and that's the main output and that's generating uh, 120 amps of plus 5 volts but that transformer also has a bunch of other windings that go up to the auxiliary board and the auxiliary board has the two 12 volt and the 24 volt power supplies on it and uh, yeah the other thing I noticed was that I measured the resistances on the transistors and I noticed that all the base emitters were under one ohm so I'm going to assume that there's a transformer somewhere that's driving those base emitters of the H bridge interesting that uh, you know they're using NPN transistors because when this thing was built back in the late 80s power FETs weren't really up to the task or maybe they were really expensive at the time. Uh, in fact this design, who knows when this design was de originally designed, it was probably designed in the, in the early to mid 80's. Because of the low resistance that I measure on the on the base emitters of the H-bridge transistors I'm going to assume that that's being driven by a uh, transformer driven which is probably the only sensible way to do it. The other advantage of it using a transformer is it can be a step down transformer. You can start with 12 or 24 volts on the drive side 
and then reduce it to two or three volts on the base emitter. Let's say they're running them at 10 amps, um, and that's just a guess. So you probably need a, a full amp of base current to turn each transistor on. And that transistor transformer, the base, if there is a base drive transformer, the base drive transformer will tend to uh, decrease the voltage and increase the current available to drive those uh, those transistors. I haven't figured out how the auxiliary supplies work, but I know that there's windings going up to the. Uh, they look like center tap windings going up to the board, and then the rectifiers, filters, and switching regulators for each output are on that second board. I haven't drawn any of the control circuitry for the power supply yet, and the reason for that is because it's all heavily buried. I can see the back of the control circuitry board, but I can't see anything on the front, so I can't tell what kind of chip they use. Anyway, there's a lot to see inside it, and uh, I think based on this general block diagram, we can go take a tour of what's, uh, of what's inside the unit. So this is the power supply partially disassembled. There's a lot of wires and some pretty beefy wires connecting some of these assemblies. So it's really hard to separate everything out. For example, I've got the front panel off just enough, but the AC wires going to this board are very stiff and, uh, and strong, so I wasn't able to get that off. I got the DC output assembly um, removed from the front panel, but until I get the AC wires removed, if I do that, uh, I'm not gonna be able to uh, remove the front panel anymore. It's, you can see the front panel. There's the, there's the front panel. I'll give a quick tour. There's the H bridge. There's the input filter capacitors, the six capacitors. There's the input diode bridge. There's the AC filter. There's the main transformer there. And you gotta love this. This is the uh, main output diode bridge, the 120 amp diode bridge. And then up here, let's see, I can, you can see I have this, I'm using a screwdriver to prop this board. It's kind of precariously perched there. This is the main, oh, uh, sorry, this is the auxiliary three power supplies. Each one has a beefy inductor, uh, a heat sink. I'm guessing these are buck converters, but I don't, I have no idea. And they, I can see the control circuitry for these. And it doesn't look like there's a, any control ICs. All I see is a um, is an op amp on each one. There's the input filters. I haven't located the input diodes yet for each each of those three power supplies, but uh, they got to be in there somewhere. This is the remote sense connector. I had to remove that from the front panel. This goes down. This connector goes down to this board here, which is sort of tucked in, and I have no idea what that does. Um, some kind of interface between the 5 volt section and the, and the uh, auxiliary power supplies. Maybe, maybe just provide status information. There's this annoying cable here which prevents me from flipping the thing up all the way without cutting it. That's a three terminal stud mounted uh, device isolated from the chassis. So I, I'm going to assume that's a triac. Um, but it might be an, it might be an SCR. Oh yeah, it's, it's wired on the AC side. So Let's see if we can get a pointer here. This is the this is the AC side of the bridge rectifier, and these two terminals are the are the DC side. And the DC side goes directly to the capacitors. And, the, and notice that this triac circuit is wired on the AC side. So I'm going to assume for now that that power resistor, pretty beefy power resistor, twelve what is it, twelve point five ohms. Uh, is providing the initial charge for the capacitors and then the, the triac turns on and gives it the full power. Big old capacitors there and that leads over to the other side. So the other side, this is the uh, H bridge and they even, you know, the obvious way to draw, to build an H bridge is in the shape of an H and there's the four, the four FETs that drive the H bridge connected to that circuit board. Uh, I assume that 
beefy resistor and this two capacitors are a snubber for the uh, output of the H bridge before it goes into the transformer. I'm going to guess this is this big film capacitor and resistor here and power resistor here is another snubber. Uh, I haven't figured out how that's how that's wired up yet. Let me reposition here so we can see the uh, output diode bridge. So that uh, big heatsink in the center there is uh, mounting the mounting for the 120 amp uh, diodes. And those are stud mounted, stud mounted uh, diode rectifiers, and you can see that they're coming off tape winding of the output of the main transformer. So that's the that's the high current side of the main transformer. The primary the, of the winding comes from the H bridge, and that's on the other side of this transformer as well. And those are all the secondary windings going up to the going up to the auxiliary board. It's another circuit board here, which I had to take off to get it apart. And there's a beef you have no idea what this is doing. That's, there's a uh, let's see. One. Oh, there we go. And the Tower of Babel finally collapses. Um, there's at least one beefy power resistor on that board. What does it do? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, and then also there's a there's another AC transformer there. That oh the 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 main transformer is interesting. Let's see if I can get a shot of it from the other other direction. Here's the view from the other side. Uh, there's the big H bridge heatsink, the main switching transformer. Those three windings on the bottom are the primary for the main switching transformer, and the and the wires going up to the auxiliary board are the secondaries for the for the auxiliaries. But notice that there's one bracket holding two transformers together. And I don't think that was done for magnetic reasons. Uh, the bottom one looks like an, it's a it's a iron core transformer, so I assume it's an AC transformer, probably generating auxiliary voltages for the uh, for for power supply control. But you can see there's no you can't see any windings on it at all, so I can't tell what it's what it's connected to. There's another AC transformer over here with some pretty beefy wires coming off of its. Uh, off the second, I assume that's the secondary. So I have no idea what this one's doing either. So there's two AC transformers in here. Then you just get a little sneak peek on the board. Let's see if I can get some light in there. Oh, there we go. You can see the on the inside. You can see the big diode bridge, output diode bridge heatsink. And there's another little transformer here. Again, no idea what it's doing. You can see it's got a little diode bridge and filter capacitor on it so what's it doing we don't know so um, like I said the, the the big mystery here is trying to find the uh, H bridge drive transformer I still haven't found that yet and for all I know this could be a this could be an inductor but the fact that it's an AC uh, that's a it's a uh, iron core tells me that it's a 60 Hertz part so So that's about as far as I can see. So now the problem. The problem is that all the control circuitry for this power supply is underneath the that big massive uh, output diode heatsink. So unless I can get that out, I won't even be able to look at the control circuitry. And so so far, I have measured the input AC and the DC 320 volts and they're all good. Uh, the transistors look good on the H bridge and I measured the output. Uh, oh, here's the two output capacitors. Notice the values on those. 46,000 microfarads. That's a pretty amazing capacitor. 7.5 volts. And there's two of them in parallel. And there's the... Uh, oh yeah, I haven't shown you this yet. This is the output board, so this is probably where the remote, sen the local sensing is done, and there's some high frequency capacitor, uh, capacitor filters on that as well. This is the, 
sort of the bulk capacitors for the output. But and you can see the uh, bus bars that are used to connect to them are pretty massive. So then, yeah, this I haven't figured out how to get this heat sink out of here. That looks like uh, a, a huge challenge because it's soldered directly to the uh, to the output transformer. So the output the out, the main transformer has got to come out, but that main transformer is on a bracket with another transformer. So ah, looks like a looks like a fun disassembly, and I assume. I'm afraid that that may be a one-way disassembly. I may be able to get it apart and never get it back together again. So, so yeah, this, uh, like I say, the, the main components all seem working, but I'm not getting any, uh, I'm not getting any control. So until I figure out either what the fault condition that's causing the system to shut down is, or until I figure out what the uh, which, what, what's broken on the, uh, on the control circuitry, uh, this power supply is uh, it's not going to do anybody any good. By the way, once I put this back together, I have no use for this power supply. It's, I've replaced the one in the, in the Maxbox system with a PC power supply, which I'm very happy with. So I, I think it's very unlikely that I will put this one back in the Maxbox. It just, it's just not necessary. I am not emotionally uh, tied to getting this thing fixed or working. This is more of an informative video. Or maybe it's uh, to discourage other people from attempting to fix these things. I don't know. Or maybe, it's, maybe it can be used as a, uh, as a stepping stone for somebody who's braver than I who can actually fix these things. Anyway, that's, that's it for now. Wish me luck trying to uh, access the components on that main board. I think I may have partially solved the mystery of the base drive transformers. Turns out, if you look closely at these, these are not just current sensors. They have three windings, at least three. Uh, there's the main winding, which is a lot of wires underneath the um, underneath the yellow tape. There's this intermediate winding which is these guys and then there's a single wire running through the middle so that's the single wire running through the middle was why I assumed it was a, uh, a current sense transformer uh, but I think instead so no, and then notice on the main on the, uh, on the main circuit let's see if I can zoom in on that one there we go. Yeah, those are some D44 uh, H10, H something, H11, H something trans transistors. Those NPN power transistors are, are fast switching power transistors and those resistors. I'm pretty sure those drive the primaries, the uh, yellow um, wrapped windings of these of these transformers and that these and that the intermediate size wires, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven or so turns, that's the base drive for the transistors. And what the current winding the wire through the middle is, I have no idea. Uh, it's a, sort of the, the, the mystery of this uh, power supply. Anyway, so yeah, this, pretty sure this is the uh, base drive uh, circuit and transformers for the, uh, for the H-bridge. So once I talk myself into uh, scrapping this unit, I uh, started to disassemble it and discovered that I had to unsolder a large, large number of wires from the main board. And also there were a dozen small wires that had to be either unsoldered or cut. So I decided to get medieval on this uh, power supply. I figured that it would do more value just as a teardown, and you know, obviously a repair would be wonderful. But but I gave up on that idea. Talked myself out of it by realizing that I had no use for this thing whatsoever, <laughs> and. Uh,
that repairing it would just be for the intellectual exercise and it would be a lot more work than I really want to put into this. So anyway, uh, so here's the main board. Notice that the main transformer mounts here and only connects to the primary. They're actually, yeah, that's not true. There's another, another pair of wires that came off here for a, a additional auxiliary secondary. But once I got that off, and this entire power assembly came off. There we go. <laughs> there's the main transformers. There's the diode bridge assembly. There's the output. So I'll, I'll get into this a little bit later. But, and then that's still cabled to the auxiliary output board through these uh, secondary windings of the transformer. So that might that might warrant a little bit more investigation. But let's get back to the to the main board here. So the big mystery, what what chip are they using? And the answer is come on, focus. I'll do it the old school way. SG thirty five twenty seven A. So that's the main controller chip, and then there's a couple of smaller devices there. So a brief tour of the main board. Here's the AC input connections. Here's the fuse. Notice. Not easy to replace this fuse. You have to sort of reach in and pry it out because it was all buried. There's the input uh, uh, EMI filter, the common mode choke. There's the diode bridge and a soft start circuit. And I unscrewed the screws so that can be removed. And now you can see the uh, bulk uh, capacitors in all their glory snubber, the uh, H-bridge, let's see if we can get a, bit, get a bit better view of that, yeah that's nice, there's the H-bridge with the uh, base drive transformer, and those two power transistors and that big, those big resistors drive, drive the uh, transformers, and then working our way back, Here's the main controller, which as I said is an SG, what did I say, 3527. And I'll pull up the data sheet for that so we can take a look at take a look at that, but I'm pretty sure it's just a conventional push-pull controller. These are the dip switches for the configurations for the with how you want this thing to turn on. This is this is where I cut off the input cable, this cable here. And that one too. This, which is the uh, main control, uh, you know, on off for the uh, for the main unit and the uh, remote sense. And here's the remote. Here's the uh, sense uh, circuit board, uh, a blob capacitor, and uh, a bunch of ceramics for doing both common mode uh, and for. Uh, and for normal mode filtering, and of course the uh, the, the big output uh, terminals bolted bolted directly onto this. This was mounted right behind the rear panel, and this is some auxiliary stuff down here, which I don't quite not understand. I think I surmised about a current sensor before but this must be the uh, main current sensor and this there's actually several these guys are doing some kind of crazy current sensing this is a current sensor and there's a uh, and there's another one floating on the uh, on the main transformer assembly that I'll show you in a minute so starting at the output terminals here's the output there's a large uh, I assume it's copper, uh, plated copper, but I don't know what it is, what the metal is. But this is the this is what handles the output. There's a couple of a uh, 
couple of blob capacitors on there. Uh, and there's the two big output capacitors. And then these two wires, one of them comes directly from the heat sink. So this bus bar is bolted to the heat sink directly. And this one was a bit of a mystery. It's like, well, what's going on there? And I finally figured out that that is, if you take a look at it, you can see it's three layers. Can you see that? It's three layers of metal here. You can just see it at the, at the very end when it comes out of the heat shrink. And that's one winding of this transformer. And I looked around for a while. I was like, wait, you can't have a transformer. You can't have a core or an inductor with one wire. It has to have at least two. And sure enough, here's the second wire. And notice it's going up to this big beefy connector where it goes directly into the transformer. So that's the center tap of the all the output wires going into the directly into this inductor. So this is the output filter inductor. And I was shocked to see that it was a iron core inductor, not a ferrite. <clears throat> the transformer on the top, however, is ferrite. And the fact that they're bolted together, I think, was just done for convenience and because they needed to be next to each other. And they can't get much closer to each other than that. <laughs> so, as far as the wire lengths, uh, you can see this little... Tor um, let me put it down here. This little um, uh, toroidal core here is, a, is clearly a current sensor. And it's I'll show you, and that's wired into the... Uh, the secondary of the of the transformers, and it, and it has two uh, two of the secondaries go go to that, and the wires. You can see this. Here's the secondary of the transformer, which is also a tape wound or bus bar wound. So this is actually the the bus bar is the secondary. This is one secondary, and if you can see underneath, there's a second secondary there. So there's two secondaries. Each one, so they use this, they use, they put a little loop in the bus bar and then they soldered the wires directly in, the secondary wires directly into it. And each wire goes to an anode of the diode. So there's four of those, one, two, three, four. And then the cathodes of the diodes are the, are the metal case and those are directly bolted to the heat sink. So this, this, this heat sink is floating at the uh, positive output of the power supply. And that's why they can just bolt this big beefy bus bar directly to the to the transformer uh, to the uh, directly to the heat sink and use that as the output of course everything has to be insulated if you do that and I mentioned the electronic load circuit and this is the FET for it so this was clearly an add-on uh, show you the circuit board so yeah these two beefy wires uh, we're connected to the FET, and these are the source and gate of the of the FET. And I thought, where's the drain? Of course, the drain is the output of this. So it, the nice thing about that is the drain can be uh, screwed directly to the uh, to the heat sink, and that provides the the plus connection for the electronic load. And then there are three wires coming out. In addition to the. Uh, Let's see. So what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six wires total. So two of the wires go to the FET, and the other four wires must provide. Um, uh, they probably provide the ground to the main to the main circuit board. You can see there's an adjustment on here as well. So this uh, <clears throat> so this board probably gets an input signal telling it to turn on or turn off depending on how much how much load there is. Maybe. Maybe it's looking at the output current and it shuts off. You know, there's no need to dissipate 15 or 20 watts if the uh, if the power supply has plenty of load on it. So I'm sh I'm sure this thing shuts off when it's not needed. This this is going to the uh, soft start circuit, so the triac, and I assumed ir originally that it was AC coming off that circuit to drive this, which was a transformer. Since it was iron core, I assumed it was a uh, auxiliary transformer, but it turns out no, it's a winding. It's another winding out of the main transformer. So this is an output, not an input. <laughs> Couldn't have got it much more wrong. I assume I thought it was an AC input to a transformer. Instead, it's a high-frequency 
uh, output from uh, the main switching transformer. And this is what turns on the triac as part of the soft, soft start circuit. So once the circuit starts, this starts generating AC. That goes into the tri that gets uh, processed on the triac board, and uh, there's some resistors and capacitors on the triac board. That turns on the triac, and the triac then uh, turns on and and runs the system at full power. So that was I thought that was an interesting. But it just shows how much flexibility you can get out of a transformer. I mean, this thing is outputting, in addition to that main 120 amp 5 volt output, it's also outputting three auxiliary power supplies. That's what these were up here. You can see here's um, here's the one, two, three. There's actually four windings coming off it. This is the primary that comes is driven from the H bridge. So yeah, that's a pretty amazing little transformer. Oh, and here's another, I don't know what it is, drive some cats and dogs circuit in the, uh, but it's another auxiliary output from the transformer. So, so this transformer has, in addition to this one input and the main output, there's one, two, three, four, there's like six secondaries. There's a whole ton of stuff going on in here with a big strap holding it, uh, holding it to the circuit board. I'm kind of shocked. Both this heatsink assembly and this transformer assembly are only mounted to a G10 circuit board, uh, and it's not a thick board either. It's only a you know standard uh, 1.5 millimeter uh, board, and I think there are some uh, mechanical spacers to hold it to the uh, case, so the case provides some extra rigidity for the board. But yeah, this kind of explains why when I first took the unit apart uh, there were some loose components inside it I think they probably vibrated loose just from you know you can see there's not there's no silicone on these uh, transformers there's no silicone on the capacitors um, you know they didn't they back in the 80s they hadn't figured out a lot of stuff and it probably wasn't vibration super vibration tested so probably some of these assemblies vibrated loose and the, and the circuit the components came right off the boards. When we designed this in, we built a couple of hundred of these systems with these power supplies, and we had really good uh, reliability on the power supplies. We almost never saw a system returned for a uh, bad power supply. So I was kind of surprised when this one didn't work. Yeah, oh yeah, notice, notice they're using uh, spacers, uh, standoffs, aluminum standoffs, and, sc and screws to provide the output current here. I thought that was interesting. See if there's anything else of interest on here. No, I think I pretty much covered it all. This is the auxiliary uh, power supply board. It consists of three power supplies, uh, two 12 volts and a 24 volt in this case. And they're all floating independent power supplies, despite the fact that they're so close to each other. So they're not intended to float with, you know, hundreds or thousands of volts of isolation, just basically you can make each one plus or minus and they're probably intended to be connected to the main supply. These are the input pads that were originally wired to the main power transformer. Then there's a heat sink on each power supply and an output inductor. Uh, the capacitors are over here for the filters. And this barrier strip here outputs the three outputs from the power supplies. This connector here is the remote sense for the three power supplies and this is an interesting board it's probably a status board it has four uh, TL431 reference chips a couple of optos and a couple of transistors on it and a bunch of uh, uh, and a bunch of trim pots so I'm not sure exactly what it does yeah here's the here's the main output adjust connections so like I say, this is probably a status connection, a status board. It looks to see that all the boards are power, uh, power supplies are within the right levels. These adjustments are all internal, so it's probably a factory adjust to say, is the you know is each power supply at the right uh, uh, output status correct, and then that outputs to this connector here, which connects to the main board, plugs right into the main board. 
And let's see, there's a current measuring resistor on each channel. Uh, this is the driver and this is the uh, controller I see. So the controller is an old Motorola part, it's called an MC34060, and it's a PWM single-ended driver. It was used in buck converters for many, many years. Let's see what else I can say about that. Uh, not much. Here's the series pass uh, device. This is the input diodes. This is the uh, catch diode for the buck converters. And this is the in, in, this is a little inductor. Th these are, by the way, these are about 160 microhenries. And this one's about 1.2 microhenries. So you can see it's a little toroid. Uh, with a couple of turns on it. And when I first opened up this unit, I think it was this one here. It had a piece of, it had a heat shrink on it. It's a, here's the other ones. You can see they have heat shrink, and these are fairly well, fairly captive. But this one's not. This one's sort of floating around like a leaf in the breeze, and as a result, it uh, the wires broke off of this, and I was able to figure out where where the part went. It was just loose inside the the chassis. So I, once I looked, uh, I still had the heat shrink on it. I took the heat shrink off, just so we could get a better look at it. But uh, yeah, the wires, it's just mounted to the, the stranded wires that hold it in place. And so it broke off. I soldered it back in. I was all hopeful. This must be the problem. But that was absolutely not the problem. <laughs> Power supply still didn't work. In fact, if anything, it got worse once I took that part off. It went from outputting 4.2 volts to outputting nothing. So I think the fact that this outputs independent and fully regulated out. Uh, multiple power supplies is part of the secret sauce of this uh, this power supply. So I thought it would be worthwhile to reverse engineer how the auxiliary supplies worked. So this is this is the secondary. Uh, each There's three of these. This circuit is replicated three times on this board. And uh, there's, a, there's a secondary winding from the main power supply uh, transformer. Uh, it goes into a, uh, a diode. And that diode is bolted to the heat sink with no insulation. And so is this transistor. And the collector of the transistor is also bolted to the heat sink. So the heat sink is isolated and this, uh, and this node is the uh, actual heat sink. The, these diodes are MUR 1630s and I didn't look up the specs on that. Didn't, didn't. It's a dual diode on a TO, TO, uh, TO220 package. And this is a larger um, tab mounted like a TO218 or whatever whatever they called it back then and it's an NPN this is a this is a, a transistor called a BU W50 it's 250 volts at uh, 25 amps and it's an NPN it's a fast switching transistor then there's a, another diode here I didn't get the part number on that but that's also mounted to the heatsink then there's the inductor and these these fooled me a little bit because these are iron core inductors. I measured the inductance there about 166 microhenries. And then there's a couple of output capacitors here. Depending on the output voltage, they change the output. Uh, they change the, the size of the capacitors. So for the 12 volts, they use two 2200s at, at 20, um, 25 volt caps. And for the 24 volt supply, they use two 1000 microfarads at 35 volts. Makes sense. There's some other changes as well. And in fact, it looks like one of the auxiliary supplies has more capa current capacity than the others. In this, in the case of the power supply we bought, we didn't we didn't really care about the extra extra capabilities. So, looks like these uh, are pretty much all wired the same, or, or very similar. Um, there's uh, shunt. Re here's the shunt resistor. I think it's about five watts, and it's a 0.025 ohm series resistor and that's used to monitor the current and I didn't dig into the rest of the circuit too much I found that there was a a second NPN transistor driver to drive this one so I mean to get a to get a, a 10 amp power supply you have to drive this this uh, this uh, base of this transistor with almost an amp of current to get it to saturate nicely and to get it to control to turn on and off uh, quickly. So the transistor that they use as a driver is an MJE 
15031, and that's an 8 amp 150 volt transistor. And this is where the hand waving starts. Um, there's a 34060, which is a single ended uh, PWM controller that drives it. And uh, I, don't, I couldn't figure out, I mean, maybe I'll dig into it later, but I couldn't figure out whether this has to be synchronized to this. Because this coming, the, the voltage coming out of here is, is not a uh, smooth DC voltage, it's a pulsating. So the question is, is, does this have to be synchronized to the other main power supply and transformer? And the big answer to that is, I have no idea. I don't know. So, uh, so it's still a mystery of the, of the design. But it looks pretty conventional. There, there are a couple more wires coming down to this board. And the other parts that are on here, so I, I mentioned the MC34060. There's a TL431 on each one. And there's uh, some there's an opto isolator on each one as well. Those are the, kind of the main components that are on the on the board for each channel. So anyway, yeah, I thought this was an interesting piece of the puzzle. That's this power supply. And just for fun, let's look at the back of the of the uh, auxiliary power supply board. So you can see where the center tapped. Uh, windings from the main transformer come in. There's three of them. There's a fourth one that's not used. I suspect this is the three-channel board. They, they may make a four-channel one as well. And those go up to the... Uh, each one of these is the back side of the heat sink. This is the, this is the diodes. So these are going to the... these transformer windings are connected to here. You can see some of the windings are going through. Some of the uh, traces are on the other side of the board and then those go to the input diodes then that go, then here's the transistor the series pass transistor and here's the output catch diode and here's these are the two terminals for the large inductors and what else you can see these are the output terminals over here so each each one has the capacitors here uh, a big resistor. This is the shunt resistor in series with the ground. And here's the positive output coming straight off the uh, inductor and going to the output capacitors. See, I think it'd be fun to power this up and see if I can get uh, get some of these switchers working to see if they're independent or if they're all synchronized to the same clock. I think that's an, that'd be interesting. Um, something else going on in this board. Notice all these trim pots over here. I have no idea what these are doing. They brought them out to this side just so that they were accessible. But these are all uh, gliptol and they're all so gliptol meaning they're uh, they have gunk on them to prevent them from moving and they're, so they're all factory set. Well, I also should probably point out the uh, here's the snubbers for each each of the three power supplies. And these are right, wired directly across the uh, the differential input windings. Anything else? No, that, that pretty much covers it. So I hope you enjoyed part one of this video. Part two, I will